on Zoom. Hello. Um, does that sound okay now that there isn't so much babble? Yes, good. Okay. Yeah, Wonderful. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. It's great to see everyone chatting and having a good time with each other. Um, okay, so uh, I'm really happy to introduce our poetic opener of the evening. So we've got eight minutes of Frank Wilson coming up here. Frank Wilson turned to poetry and short story writing when he retired from academic life in the UK and shortly before he moved with his wife to Victoria. He has published three books of short stories in the UK and Canada, and in 2022, a 150 page history of Uplands Golf Club titled A Walk in the Park. He has three collections of poetry published in Canada, Chasing Crows, Apple Man, and Crows in the Apple Tree. His recent collection, Village Lines, which was a joint venture with UK artist Alan Taylor, was designed and published in Victoria, but printed in the UK. He is currently preoccupied with a new collaboration with local artist Tony Fathers to be titled Oak Bay and Not Far Away. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. I'm going to jump straight in because eight minutes is very short. Eight and a half, okay. <laughs> but you'll see why I'm jumping straight in. So I, because it's really about you. So I think I can write. Conversations captured like the scent of outdoor cigar smoke on a cold day. Indiscretions in the uncontrollable mix of strangers' cell phone conversations. Childhood hymns, prayers, songs and rhymes somehow never forgotten. Glimpses of others' kitchens flash sharp messages to a track flying brain. New hung geese on a hawthorn tree drop life's crimson jewels on fresh snow. Worn old ladies clutch worn bags of worn cheap provisions at windy bus stands. Gin-loosened high-altitude revelations of fellow sufferers on long flights. The easy feel of a perfect seven iron into a tree-framed elevated green. The wet, first gorgeous kiss from a wriggling, giggling granddaughter. The mist-blue morning hills of the first line of Karen Blixen's colonial story. Complex simplicity of Robert Frost forever mending wall or seeking a path. Envied words and sentences of others to serve as treasured models. Handel's voluntary dancing joyous reflections on an ancient church ceiling. The wet London day cries of the paper sellers telling us all that Elvis was dead. Bursts of passing music dragging me back to people and places and feelings. Pieces out of everywhere, twisted to fit some half thought out theme, delivered to the keyboard and the frightening monitor because I need to write, because I think I can write. So that's for you, <laughs> for all of us. That was out of the, that was the first poem, I think, in the first collection that was published here, uh, Chasing Crows. I hope some of you remember Ted Harrison. Ted Harrison was wonderful, wonderful man, or a wonderful artist, perhaps not as appreciated as much as he should have been, but he was pretty well appreciated. Um, I wrote a poem for his Celebration of Life event. He died eight years ago, time flies. So this is where this came from. And it got into the Apple Man book. Ted, I knew his work, as they say, from the cards introducing me to his crisp Yukon glories and for what he did for Robert Service and Sam McGee and huge skies, straight smoke chimneys, scrambling children, dogs and more dogs and blazing coloured extravagance. Matchstick Yukon people in the snow birthday greetings from the far, far away west brightened up my mantelpiece on bleak January days. And then we both moved to the village by the sea and met in the tired hotel snug over a pint of cold Guinness. 
In that sometimes helpful, occasionally annoying way, I was introduced and labeled yet again, another Brit. But he knew better and with a, they put us all in the same box, you know, raised his glass, listened and placed me from the broad acres. Sharp eyes brightened when I spoke of Coalfield school friends. He turned on his soft Durham road and talked to pastel and people and places and travel and love and luck and kids and ice and whales and multicolored seas and how the quality of beer had improved. Easy to say a life well lived, but here was one. As he captured nature's drama, splashing paint into thousands of young eyes through small red churches, snow bent houses, bright yellow trees, blue moose, and the food scrapping car cross ravens. We gave you a generous, colorful, talk filled send off, Ted, after you put aside your palette and toddled off into a star splashed sky. Children hurried brightly home in late afternoon gloom past gold town ghosts and your northern lights began to dance. That's Ted, dear Ted. This is the new book. This is the new book. This is the new book. Um, and it could change your life, but not dramatically. <laughs> Um, it is true, actually, this gives me an extra two minutes for this because it relates to Malia, as usual. It is true that we, we have met professionally, as it were, before. She said I got a voice. I thought she was talking about my baritone singing voice at the time because I hadn't really with it. But I now realise what, what she was meaning. And maybe, I hope some of it's still there. This is, well, it's, it's on the cover. But the poem is Willow's Beach Tea Room, which you may be able to relate to. The brown teapot spouts at a bebop sea and pours me back to other seaside seaweed places. Toasted raisin bread with little boy raspberry jam, sausage rolls, squishy squashy egg sandwiches and lemon tarts, oilcloth tables by the beachside windows and a million dollar view. We say it too often, but it's like turning back the decades. As sand escapes from little girls' toes, old men doze in their cups, and a new batch of fries spreads a special aroma through the cafe. Once upon a young time, in some place on the sands, we drip dropped our ice creams on crumb spread wooden floors and pleaded for more fizzy pop, more ice buns more attention. In the mishmash memory mix, there is new baked cake, flapping flannel trousers, fighting non-compliant deck chairs, and labor of love castles accepting incoming tides like the wise King Canute. Sometimes, too, ma too many times, as rain stopped play, we puddled in for invented games and sourced pork pies, and laughed at noisy Max and inside out monsooning umbrellas. I don't ask useless questions about whence went the years. This is where the plate clattering, bacon frying, kid chattering, sunburnt, wind blown, pebble washed, dog splashing good times live still. The brown teapot spouts at a bee box heat and pours me back to other seaside seaweed places. How are we doing? Get time for one more short one. Oh, bless your heart. I'll make it as short as, as, short as it was written. <laughs> Crows keep turning up a lot in what I write. Joey's got a problem with crows too. <laughs> we share this crow thing. Uh, and I think there's, there's probably crow in everything I've written in terms of the books that have come and the collections. Anyway, this one's going to be... <laughs> This one's going to be in the book that's not out yet, the one that I'm doing with a guy in England. But um, he's, he's my uh, photographer collaborator. I work a lot with artists, it's the way I work. But this is the follower crow. He followed me to school, sending unnecessary sharp warnings to others of his kind, 
with scissor eyes and waiting beaks as I trudge through chestnut leaf piles and scuff my new shoes on the hard pathway. He followed me around the farmyard in hope of spilled grain, ready to open his throat to call in fortunate family members. If I was careless when feeding the brainless hens and providing a bonus he knew was his by right. He followed me, but only in my mind, when I went to Africa, where although I learned of fish eagles and vultures and admired their skill and keen intelligence, they paled in comparison with my carrion hunting familiar. He followed me often into my poetry, like a persistent infection, giving me equal scribble scope to admire or complain, depending on my mood and his behavior, but always at the look that said, he was my clear superior. He followed me to Canada and calls across my backyard before turning an expectant gimlet eye on my digging, as though he knows well that deep inside, I remain the Wellington booted boy. He could always frighten. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Oh. Sorry, I forgot my papers. Thank you, Frank. That was lovely. Check out Frank's books after the show. Um, okay, so I'm really thrilled to introduce Malia Acker. Malia Acker is the author of three poetry collections, Hesitating Once to Feel Glory, An Airproof Green, and The Reflecting Pool, and a nonfiction book, Gardens of Flame, Gary Oak Meadows of BC's South Coast, um, which charts the Indigenous stewardship and current restoration of an endangered Vancouver Island ecosystem. I love Gary Oak Meadows. Um, Acker holds a PhD in human geography, geopoetics, as well as an MFA in poetry and an MA in literature, and lectures at the University of Victoria, Thompson Rivers University, and Camosun College. She is also currently a UVic postdoctoral re researcher funded by Cl Environment and Climate Change Canada, where she uses storytelling and art to communicate and urge action against climate change. So cool. Um, so I always like to hunt up a quote, and I found this quote um, in an interview with Nathaniel, Nathaniel G. Moore um, in the Miramichi Reader, and Malia said, I'm a fan of Creeley's assertion that poems are transmission. You tune in and scribe what they're saying. They, there are sharper turns in this book. Nothing hangs out for too long, and the metaphors build and pile on one another. One another. That seems to me to be a more full way of working for me right now. I wanted thickness and richness and a sense of accumulation that doesn't wait, but just keeps moving. So I love that. I'm really looking forward to hearing that right now. Welcome, Malia. Thanks so much, everybody. Oh my God, I get to see myself while I'm here. My hair is so bad. <laughs> One second. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's so much better. <laughs> okay, everyone on Zoom, yes. My parents, there they are. Hello. Hello, parents. <laughs> yeah, it's very sweet. Can you all hear me? No. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to read from uh, from this this new book mainly. Um, this came out with Nightwood Editions last June, and um, it was my first book in ten years, and um, it kind of marked the separation of or the return, I guess, of my life to um, the art the artistic realm. Um, because I was seven years in a doctoral program and it nearly killed me. It does <laughs> most people, I think. <laughs> and um, so returning to this has been really lovely and to the practice of writing um, in the longer term. I think it takes a while to recover from something like that. Um, and uh, so these poems were actually written um, a fair number of years ago. They were um, predominantly written when I was um, studying for my comprehensive exams um, and I was living in Mexico at the time. 
And uh, so most of the book takes place there. And um, I'm gonna start out with a, the title poem called Hesitating Words to Feel Glory. Sometimes I think we can see the world before it began. And that's what makes us so sad. Before the world began, there were swallows flying across a lakeside field as the sun allowed the trees to shade it. There were falling leaves from dry seasons that made a golden road. And there was silver and stone and clover and a man on horseback with a dog with no tail that loped across the field in a lazy semi-crescent as though drawing the orbit of a small moon. There was a burrow on a 10 foot length of rope stomping a dust patch in the earth and there were pelicans with injured wings hand fed by a waiter and so many willows, so many growing by the water's edge. There was the clink of bottles before the world began and so its sound still makes us melancholy the way ice can, booming on a river in spring or tilling a glass in a woman's hand. Stones too, uncovered from earth, pockmarked with clam houses and also clams. Pianos, there were pianos too, their cascade made us restless. They could not offer more nuance than the half note. Things kept coming before the world began and stacked and tumbled over themselves in drifts like snow, insensible. The world before the world was annotated, expansive, all the stones the boys could throw, never hesitating once to feel glory, to feel jealousy, boredom, and the nostalgia of the grass feels as it clambers above itself and loses its former lives in the clean, disintegrating thatch and dust and clay. The sadness of the alternate armed rower who walked his boat to shore. The sadness of the far shore and the thud of a foot against a ball, the bent hook of wire hanging from a tree's lost branch stub, the question in the ibis's voice, the sudden flash of a red <coughs> bird, like a compass of ink in the brush. Before the world began, there were bells that never rang the correct tongue, and wings and spheres of sad eggs in water. The burrows walked his circle, and the carpenter never saw his children further than the sixth grade. He never painted his room yellow or cooked on anything but a burner on a board. And the neighbor, after the party, she never gave the plate back, though she said she would. She always said she would. So, um, <laughs> I lived in a, in a small town that was a little bit south of Guadalajara in the central highland um, of Jalisco. Um, speak louder. Oh, I can yeah. alter the <laughs> I'm, um, I'm a bit sleep deprived, so that might be the, the, uh, the cause of the quietness of voice. I have a 17 year old lab of shepherd, Bernice Mountain, collie slash wolf dog. And 17 is very old for a dog of that size. Um, but she doesn't sleep well. And because of that, I don't sleep well. <laughs> because if we don't sleep well, then she does bad things in the middle of the night. <laughs> it don't go well for the house or for me. So it's better for me to be up, but it's still like the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, this town um, is a very strange town. It's a bit of an, an artist enclave um, in, the, uh, in the 40s. Uh, artists used to hang out there, writers, uh, Paul Bowles was there for a while. Um, <clears throat> and um, there's a, there was a character called, the, that I, I named the dictator, his, his name is Antonio, but um, he used to drive his car down to the edge of the lake, set up his speakers, giant speakers on the roof, and his, uh, play his saxophone along to the music. And he would, um, instruct the town on what good music was. Um, <laughs> and uh, fortunately he had excellent taste. <laughs> Maybe the rest of the town didn't think so, but I thought he was great. So I called him the dictator. So this is the dictator. The dictator puts on music for 18 musicians, section four. These are the last hours of the year before Maximino gives his children to the Americans. They still live in two rooms beside his carpenter's workshop, illuminated by stars by night, by dusk by day. Section five begins. 
the iron worker, has finished his calla lily doors. He's doing something pedestrian now, maybe the framing for a toilet. The carpenters drag their new saw inside up the furred cement stairs. In two rooms, two beds sleep five. On the roof, the cistern, the tree that hides bathing, the neighbors from which there is no invitation. In an hour, the bats will emerge from their little ceramic shells. As the last of the sun stumbles into the lake, the dictator parked at the edge with his extraordinary car battery and his ridiculous heart turns up the speaker on the roof and cues up some Lionel Richie. Mm -hmm. Then a little Brahms. It's early, Lionel Richie, so it's okay. Notice the stomped, broad-leafed glass, the gelatin air at its inconsequential hinge, the last cloud banks spitting out a star. Is it possible he is playing out our life? Baker, Sosa, Ibanez, Bach, pulled in all directions, all incompatible. We are little racing dogs just bathed. Someone lights a bonfire in the field of the Roma. Maxie's children fix themselves at the edge. The oars of the fishermen flake the mother of Pearl Lake as the dictator slides on his black gloves, lifts his wand from the car's roof, pulls out all the stops. Cities fall. He takes a drink, they bubble up again as the dust of the unremarkable and meets its maker, the one with the skin of damp gold, his palm up, palm open as the mind of a dog, is the tricks of a child. <laughs> <laughs> this one's for Ali, this is exit. Airless wonder. And I should say that um, this was one of the most um, one of the happiest periods of my life um, living in this town. Um, and I wrote almost exclusively about anxiety and sadness. Funny <laughs> 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 <I knew> that. <laughs> Aaron's wonder. As the cake glass descends, my breath ups the humidity. Outside, the burrow continues his circle, spirographing his life away as the fishermen up to their waists advance without ceremony into the profuse medium of meeting. The music tries to, tries to lead, and my leash catches short. My cake glass is made of clear lead and loss. The worry machine clocks its 24-hour shift. Its workers, their cape of kestrel feathers, their hands free to lock my throat. Work will set you free, whispers the grass and the broken speakers and the metal of the constantly conversing swings. I look for a drinking straw somewhere discarded with the leftover breath of a person not unhappy, a person whom chest high waves do not deter from calmly lowering a net into the opaque water, scooping out the silver light fish to reach without seeing to be a diver in the dark, to have no glass. The clear air and the wet turmoil of their forearms, they do not startle. The water hits their lips. The net is heavy, the silver close. Little harp with their pale rose bellies below the concrete walkway, the ardent dam. One turns in the water. I lift the glass. Disaster. I keep the glass. Disaster. Okay, um, here's another anxious one. <laughs> they're fun, even though they're anxious. Though. That's, I think maybe who knows? They're like shrugging films, kind of like Am Amory from last one. <laughs> Open one alone. Hello, old feeling. It's not been long enough. Access to the central holding facility of joy has been curtailed for all of those not in a pool or cutting pine with an antiquated saw. Pendejo, call the boys, while a love song croons, its accordionist high on playing a straight man. Again and again, the flicker into new territory, then out to a light like Napoleon the hummingbird on the chain link, just inside the zone of ownership. Every time he flies past, he takes another handful of dust off my body. 
by tomorrow, just the sheen of mechanicality. Like how a swimming pool changes from turquoise to white smear when used as it should be. Little voice, you're like those colored flags planted atop the next to furthest jungled hill. It will never be easy, say your flickering oyster shell forms. You'll never get out of this alive. Another love song concurs. And I'm hungry and cold, adds the singer. Her armies all burned at the edge of the city. Give me the pass, I whisper to the little voice. You can have my firstborn, my money, the almond croissant I'm eating by pieces to pretend I'm not eating the whole thing. You can have the North's lotus eaters, dark furs, and my moon rising with Pluto, poor Pluto, in one of 12 houses, which was told to me this morning, but because I am without any earth, apparently leaves my head immediately. I see a bare arm gleam at the pool's edge and think I might just believe in industry, in the, gu the guillotine operator, shading his eyes, seeing his wife hooking the leather strap to hold the metal blade before stepping off the wood platform through the crowd. I am tired and volcanic. I would never have made a good Penelope. I'd have taken the suitors one by one on the infinite cushions of the day bed with its view of the sea, then had them brutalized by dogs. <laughs> one of the boys paddles to the concrete edge of the water, levers out to his waist, then falls back in. He does this again and again, and it is the most pleasurable thing in the world, obviously, to use himself between mediums like this to be briefly, perfectly, both latch and key. Mm -hmm. um, here's another dictator. He, he was so adorable. <laughs> and a total pain in the ass. He used to stretch it an extension cord across the whole malecon where people would walk and uh, so that he could power his speakers. <laughs> Sometimes I think he is all of us, sitting on the tailgates of our cars in the tumbling lights, staring out at the weighted storm that will not pass overhead but slant south, missing us. A lodestone, your very farms, pine forests, the volcano that coughs. Playing each track as a bomb. There was that moment, sang Shirley Horn, when my heart sitting beside the back tire, beat wildly against its instrument case. When the white bird picked its way closer and ate all our pain. He puts his lips together, trying to look elsewhere. The lake turns to river and begins to slick by. Leaning back, he watches things of wood and wing, things of praise and shame, the larger skiffs and the smaller tempests. Every night, the spark of the speakers, holding his hand out, filling it, handing us a world broken by Milanese into faultless rafts. Are you ready to go at any time? He asks. Are you ready to go? Um, a lot of these poems were actually written um, at the feet of his musical choices. Um, I would walk. I would read in the mornings and then I would write in the afternoons. Um, I would usually fill a giant um, water bottle with um, about one third tequila and, <laughs> and uh, two thirds um, escort, which is this very sweet um, Mexican pop. And then I'd go for a very long walk and end up um, sitting in front of him. And I would sit on my wall and he'd be down in his car and we would both do our artistic thing. And we wouldn't really look at each other other than the occasional sidelong glance. And we would just acknowledge that we were in our artistic spaces. And I would write poems based on what he was playing and, and he would play his, his music and play along to it. And then maybe afterwards we'd come back together and have chats. But we always maintained this really lovely distance, which I, I thought was, was very extraordinary. It was hard to get that with somebody. Um, so I'm only at 16 minutes. It's gone much faster than I thought it would. So I'm going to go back just a little bit. and one more from the beginning. I have a couple more to end. Um, this is Fealty of the Short Dark Field. 
I've been experimenting with which additives make the black crater inside myself shrink or grow. The recipe is amazed. Loneliness fills it with potash. A particularly tender person burns the interior like a November pumpkin. I'm like a porch dog on the top step arrowed toward the world. Occasionally, I blunder down and make a half-hearted nest in the grass. Mostly, my interiors are clear cuts on some northwestern island southern people think is perpetually covered in snow and eastern people think is evidence of our weakness. We're just a minority here amongst the brightening alder stems and the occasional uncut fur standing like a starved sheriff in the field. My West is a peculiar mix of fermented berries and machinery parts covered in moss that makes the hogs shine like onyx, which I have always wanted to put in a palm cage and adorn like a Christmas palm. I know I will never be good. My worry machine is not the shape of country in the Americas. It does not purr as the machete's blade rises. It is a soft, multiple feeling, like being alone on the lakeside walkway in the midst of 100 families, then returning weeks later on somebody's arm and not even recognizing the place. A dog finds the entrance to the crater, enters is through a rabbit tunnel, her tail faintly swaying. The invincibility of appearances is where a failure becomes universal, becomes something even you are doing. It's where the poem cage's front viewing window opens to the public and everyone can see the prey I eat wasn't caught by me. Okay, um, a couple of dark poems to end things off. <laughs> I'm, yeah, the only way to deal with this is to write dark poems. She's, um, it's, she's my longest relationship. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about me. <laughs> this is night. There is perhaps no one I have touched more. In fact, I know this. I find her at the bottom of the ramp that we built, one leg hooked to the ledge, the rest of her on the concrete, barking. Lift her to standing a few times, steady her, guide her up the slope and back to bed. Full length spoon for a moment and tell the sigh, the licked lips, the slowed breath. <clears throat> she looks up as I go to write this. It's 5 a.m. Touching the length of her body is like petting a mink, something both wild and broken in, a blackness that gives way to fizzled gray, no way to skin, an impossibly well-made thing that walks like an 80s Casio keyboard, <laughs> that resists every urging like a mule. Her ears straight flopped now watching me. And then one calls room. We enter the torture chamber side by side. Her hindquarters bumping my leg, my leg aligning her hip. Her machine is pain. Mine is sleeplessness. No one is in the room beside us, but there's a window at one end that looks out to some trees, poplars, and a rain cloud obscuring only half night's moonlit blue. It does not go on forever. There are often breaks I didn't expect, though I am dizzy and strange while she sleeps, something like peace sparking her fur. And we weather both this inside a respite of no language and its alternates, which is still full of our shared repertoire of touch and voice and blankets and dark. I didn't expect the room to be so warm. I didn't expect her breath like music. 
She laughs, she sighs. She mostly does not look at me unless I am not looking at her. Moths knit the room's corners, tightening the strings, nudging me to make sure I don't doze. I read, I watch spiders, and her sleeping ears and throat and paws and legs stretch against me, young, briefly. And when she wakes and returns to the room, I heave her up and wait for purchase on the stone floor and guide her to the beef heart and chicken bones and salmon and squash that will ensure she glances out the window at my future sing singularity and then away that will ensure this lasts. Thank you.